But I don't know if he hit with a. It's a good feel. It's a good feel. Yeah, she's been back in like 20 minutes. He's done for a thing, right? 18. I'm old, I can say that to you. Stop drinking soda. Leave soda alone. Initially, this was going to be a panel and a discussion, but we're going to um, restructure it so it's the, discu the discussion part for all equal participants in it. So we're grateful that you are the special guest who did actually show up. <laughs> the first thing we'll do is um, go ahead and introduce yourself. And after you say who you are, um, say something about um, when you were growing up, what did you believe about homosexuality? What was your your first beliefs, like, around the I'll begin. I, when I was a child and growing up. And who you are. My name is Jeffrey Kent, and I'm the artist who painted and created the artwork in this exhibition. Mm -hmm. That's entitled Preach, which was entitled by Michael. First of all, I didn't know anything about homosexuality. And as I grew up in a single parent home, the only thing I can say I knew, or as I learned about gender, that there was such thing as a man and a woman. Also realized that there was such thing as a family structure where there was a father and a mother and children. Then, as I maybe, I guess I didn't realize there was even a such thing as homosexuality until I probably got into the 10th grade in high school, where I had men, well, it was a student, peers, who had feminine personalities and who were teased and I felt I needed to stay away from them because they were different. And I didn't want to be, I never befriended any of these particular individuals. Uh, and then as I even got older, I did find out about homosexuality. And even then I shunned it because I never had attraction, physical attraction for a man. I only had physical attraction for women. So I didn't understand it. And one of the things that developed from my ignorance for understanding homosexuality was something I shared moments ago was I started my creative endeavor and path wanting to do first commercial art, it wasn't called graphic design back in the 60s and 70s. Then, when I learned about style and fashion, I wanted to be a fashion designer. And that's what I ended up studying when I first graduated from high school, was fashion design. That's when I had my most exposure with homosexuality. And that's where my homophobia really kicked in, where I changed my path from fashion design and fashion merchandise because I didn't want to be involved in being that close, thinking that somehow it's going to affect me and I may become a homosexual. And so I avoided that path and, and that kind of is what leads me into where I am now today 
where I started painting from being burnt out from merchandising and retail. That's what it ended up being. I studied merchandising, but I ended up being basically a store manager, retail store manager. Uh, and so I guess that kind of explains how I grew up thinking about homosexuality. I, I grew up believing, I didn't really, wasn't taught anything about homosexuality. I only went through my internal feelings and my observations. possible to try to speak a little louder? Okay. My first encounter with homosexuality would have to be in middle school. Um, I had a really good friend of mine that was black, so I went to college black middle school that came out to me. And I was never taught by my family to respect anyone's feelings or anyone's actions towards anybody. I would always thought that everybody was created equal and as long as nobody was harming me or harming themselves, then it was okay. So that was a very consistent experience. So your experience was specific, I mean, related to, even though there are people that you may meet that are different, yeah. including sexual gender, you still treat them the same as if yep. you're treating your sister or brother. Mm -hmm. So, um, welcome there. Uh, and you were in How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. Yes. See you. So um, the, the conversation has become very intimate, so we're all kind of equally participating in it. Okay. Um, and the question, um, and it's being videotaped, so if you don't want to be videotaped, just sort of say so. Um, and the question that we're going around answering is uh, the idea of, uh, when you were growing up, what did you believe about homosexuality? Oh, okay. So we'll go with Kate, and then we'll just keep going around the circle. Um, and introduce yourself a little bit too. Okay. Um, okay. I'm Kate Smith, of course. I'm another one of the EDS students, um, and uh, I'm a sort of senior in MICA. Um, I did. I don't know. I and this is a. I'm one of. I'm on the education team. I'm one of the uh, one of the group that helped put together the community chat. So I've been thinking about this question for for a while now, and I. It's strange because I don't know if I believed anything in particular about it, but because um, I don't know if I particularly knew what it was. Um, I remember when, like, when I was in elementary school, um, I had this really close knit um, group of three other uh, female friends, and we were all really affectionate with each other. Um, and um, and and in and in class, like you know, like there were there were you know other kids that would like make fun of us and like call us lesbians or whatever. And you know, and I, 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 I don't remember really knowing what that was. Um, or like I would hear, I would hear, you know, other like kids being like, oh my God, that's so gay to something, you know, to whatever, like, you know, they canceled, they like canceled, you know, dodgeball in gym class, oh my God, that's so gay. Um, and I like, and I, you know, um, and I just, his, his, I know, I, I didn't, I just, I didn't know anyone he was, and I didn't, I just didn't have any experience with it, and so I, it wasn't until, it really wasn't until high school that, um, that I, I made, I, I made some, I, I had friends in high school who were, um, were very openly, um, gay and lesbian, and, and I think, and so, because of that, because I really just, have any experience with it and didn't have any thoughts on it previously. Um, it was just sort of this, aim, like, this thing that existed out in the world that, you know, that didn't seem to have any effect on my life. Um, so it's, it, it seems, it seems odd to me because it's, it's an issue nowadays that, that I care about pretty strongly. It seems odd to me that from but literally for you know, so much of my life thus far, I literally had no thoughts on it whatsoever. So. 
Yeah, my name is uh, Larry Brumfield. I'm a pastor in the uh, Brethren Church. Uh, some people may not know what Brethren are, but <laughs> they're kind of a, a, uh, a progressive uh, uh, Protestant sect started in the mid 17th century Europe. Europe. Uh, they were kind of always on the right side of social issues, as I believe. This is just why I gravitated towards them. Uh, they were abolitionists. Uh, they supported women in the pulpit way before you know, most Protestant churches did so. Anyway, progressing through, I was born in Chicago and kind of progressed between both sides of the border, between Chicago and Gary, Indiana. And I didn't really know how blessed I was until I got older and wanted to kind of be involved in the social justice issues such as you know gender equality my mother was a entertainer and she in chicago she was a loud singer cabaret singer that kind of thing and then she went to church on sunday and sang in the choir so i grew up in that kind of an atmosphere where people came to our house and it didn't matter what they were nobody questioned what they were everybody was like family and later on of course i found out some uh, about someone's sexual identity by accident, but it wasn't on the main thing about their character. They were my uncles, they were my aunts, they were my mother's friends, and I really, again, as I look back, it was it was just my atmosphere. I was kind of blessed to be raised in that kind of an atmosphere. Uh, as I grew older, started my family going to college. I was a college athlete, so I was kind of distracted from all that. I was into myself, raising my family and all that kind of thing. And uh, I, my mother and I started talking, and she would say so-and-so couldn't get an apartment because uh, you know they're, they're gay, or, or so-and-so was denied this and denied that. I became kind of consciously aware of it again. And some of the people who may be here in the African-American community, we have what we call play families sometimes in our, in our uh, circle. And these people were like my family. I called them my play. They were my aunts. I called them uncle and aunt so-and-so. And I said, this is just wrong. I mean, it just hit to the core of my uh, need to do something for self I mean, I came from the, from, the, from the Vietnam era, so I was protesting. I came, you know, from the King era, and I kind of marched and so forth. So I had that core in my uh, core uh, belief or co core asset in my character. And uh, I... Uh, decided that I was just going to get involved in this movement and do what I can for my family, as I thought in my mind, and just as a basic civil right uh, as for mankind, if you will. And so it wasn't anything that I kind of thought of. I, I saw the hypocrisy. As I got older, as a teenager, I saw the hypocrisy because I, I, I saw how these preachers would get up in church and call on choir director to give them a song so they could worship in the proper spirit and get the church all riled up and then turn around and face the congregation and condemn them to hell. You know, and I said, <laughs> you know, I'm not stupid. I say, that's not right, you know. And uh, so as I progressed through my life, I saw the hypocrisy in the community and uh, certainly had personal feelings for, for uh, the people I knew who were just suffering because of who they were, you know, who they chose to love. Um, I'm named Arde. I'm in the EDS, I'm one of the curatorial team that put together this exhibition. Um, I guess, I don't know when I like learned about homosexuality, but I think I knew about it throughout all of elementary school. I grew up with a very like traditional Irish Catholic like kind of household with like a mother and father family structure and like it's very like traditional roles. And they're socially conservative, so I guess I grew up with, I mean, my parents aren't extremely pro marriage equality or anything like that, so it was a weird structure, I guess. Well, no, it was a formal structure, not a weird structure, but it was, um, yeah, so I grew up, like, always respecting people. My parents, like, always taught me to respect everyone equally, but I know that they were slightly but I grew up and I had um, some gay friends that I knew were gay throughout all of like high school and I was like fine with them, like, it was fine, but I do know that like my actions up 
until then, like, oh, we're never fully informed. I never really, like, I would be saying gay, like, without thinking about it. But finally, when I came to Mike, I was in such an open community. Like, I finally realized, like, what homosexuality actually is. I think I finally got informed, and now I'm very pro marriage equality. I was on the Republican stage for a while where I wasn't embarrassed, like, but um, yeah. So I guess that's been my experience with homosexuality. Um, I'm Amanda Ackerman. <coughs> Um, I'm from Lancaster, like, Pennsylvania, which is pretty conservative, um, but I was adopted when I was 20 days old by two lesbians, um, and they have been my parents ever since. Um, so, besides the fact that um, growing up not having like that male presence really in the household, um, I'm, they are both Caucasian and I'm um, mixed. Uh, so these kind of things were the things that we discussed very openly um, growing up because it was a clear difference from what I was constantly seeing every day with um, my classmates and um, kids around the neighborhood. Um, so, I grew up very open-minded. Um, my mom, Arlene, she is a pastor in a predominantly gay and lesbian community church. Um, so, I've been raised in the faith and very proud Christian, very um, just open about my life and very comfortable with um, the way I was raised. I'm, I'm very grateful for the family that I have. So um, for me, just it was kind of something that was normal to me. Um, we didn't, we, I experienced um, kind of some shunning from our family. My uncles and aunts, they um, didn't really approve for a really long time. And um, so it wasn't until I was like 16 that we really communicated with them. Um, because all, along with them not really approving of um, my mom's being together, they didn't approve of them adopting a child that was biracial. Um, so, and like just starting a family period. So I like dealt with the the issues that I guess come along with uh, other people's views on homosexuality. Um, and I feel very comfortable in who I am. Um, and I still, you know, I respect um, others' opinions completely, but this is just, that's my background. Maggie Fitzpatrick. I'm also an education in the ES. Um, I grew up in North New Jersey, uh, right outside of New York City, which is pretty liberal in general. Um, but I went to a private Catholic school for elementary school. And I mean, I, I never really. <laughs> fit in, I guess, and um, it was a very, like, um, homophobic community in general, I think, there. And so, like, even from being very young, like, a lot of, like, like, bullying would be, like, based in either, like, uh, you know, like, saying somebody was gay or that bizarrely, they, they were Jewish, which makes no sense. Um, children very odd. Um, and I, in particular, 
um, would get that treatment, especially, I mean, uh, yeah, just like nasty names and things, and I don't know, it was sort of odd. And then I remember even like, so like I guess I had some like feelings about that that were kind of negative and I think I must have said something once, but my parents never really just said anything about it. I don't know. I guess they just like assumed. They assumed, but um, then I remember saying something about it, and my parents being like very shocked that I would have like that kind of idea because it was so different from their own. And then in middle school, I switched to a public school, which doesn't really matter, but I guess I. More importantly, I realized that I personally was attracted to women, and that was like very confusing for me. And I still don't think like even most of my friends, like most of my like best friends in high school, don't know. And I like came out to my mother literally like five days ago. Um, which was fine. I, I I don't know. I just have always been very like uncomfortable with it personally, but feel like I've always have never had a problem at all with like other people being homosexual. Um, but I think like my own experience, I've been sort of very stressful for me. My name is David, David Ames, and I was born in the 50s. So I'm older than every except for me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and your first name is? Larry. Larry. Simple Larry. Larry. So I'm born in the 50s. <laughs> I'm quite familiar with the struggle for civil rights. I know about it uh, by way of my teaching in my home. Pastor, senior pastor in the Baltimore area, I have been now the pastor for 35 years. I grew up in the home and I was taught from an early age the Word of God. And from a biblical perspective, that God's Word is inerrant, it is true. And so what God says is therefore true. That's the perspective with which I grew up. Relative to sexuality, my parents taught me I was in Home where mom and dad both there had siblings, brothers, and one sister. Uh, for the most part, she ruled the house. Still haven't forgiven her for that, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, it was it was a wonderful environment. They taught us about sexuality as God designed humanity, both male and and that's the way I've grown. That's the way I uh, reinforced it, in fact, in my training, in my training. I'm pursuing now my PhD at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. And every, every <laughs> thing about me is oriented toward what God has said. So I come from, I come from that perspective. Uh, however, I will say this. Uh, I, I am somewhat disturbed at times come from that perspective, and I'm being accused of being one homophobic. Uh, it's not a phobia. I, I don't fear people. I don't fear their gender, or rather their uh, preference, sexual preference. That's, that's not fear. It, it's just that I am biblically biased, and I have nothing to be afraid of. So my, my stance is not out of fear. Uh, it's, it's based on it's true. Uh, my understanding of humanity comes from that grid, from uh, how God designed us. So my preaching, my teaching, obviously, is, is very uh, biblical in its orientation. Uh, we teach it. In fact, right now, I'm uh, teaching a series called Marriage is Design. And uh, one of the uh, aspects of it is, perhaps we'll get into it later, but uh, in any event, quite uh, content with my perspective. And I 
guess you probably invited me here, perhaps to get more information about that perspective, because I, I feel like I'm, based on what I've heard, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm an anomaly here, so I feel like I'm sticking out like <laughs> stick in the mud. But even so, I, I, um, I'm glad to be here. Really don't mind the, the interaction. Um, I will say that on both sides of this argument, it has been quite uh, vigorous and sometimes unfair, I think, in terms of the accusations and the, the name calling, the uh, pejoratives that have been, it, it just stirs the pot. It doesn't really get to the, the issue. I'm one, I'd like to talk about the issue without the emotional uh, stigmas that are attached to uh, the discussions. So thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. at the signing of at, at the, in Annapolis a few times. Were you at Annapolis? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was there. Okay. And I barely had my call. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I'm Jeffrey Cudlin, I'm the instructor for these fine students in front of you, and uh, uh, helping facilitate this exhibition that they designed and implemented over the course of a year. Um, I've been teaching at MICA for, this is my second year teaching, so not very long. Before that I was curating at a, a, a private nonprofit arts center in, in Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C., the Arlington Arts Center. Uh, before that, I was a practicing artist and teaching art and art theory. Before that, I was a painter. Before that, I was a rock musician. Before that, what was I doing? Um, so, but uh, um, the, the, I think the question is both smart and, and, and a, a, a little troubling, as I heard you sort of saying it. So, the, on, the, on the one hand, it's like I think it's smart to, to lead talking about people's experiences with homosexuality sexuality and not talking about gay marriage, which is what we're going to talk about, and just sort of start mm -hmm. a step back from that. But I also feel like there's a, a, a supposition in the question by asking what you were taught when you grew up, that this is something that somehow we're all supposed to grow out of. Um, you know, whatever we were taught or whatever we learned that when we were younger, we're supposed to at some point forsake. Um, I'm sure that's not the intent of the question, but like as I heard it being read in the room, because we talked about this, or I watched this conversation unfold online, I was like, oh yeah, that's a great first question. I heard you saying it. I said, there's you know, one person in the room, everyone else in the room is going to say, this is what my parents believe, and this is what I believe, and we're going to get to you. Um, Aside from that, in terms of you know what I grew up believing, um, I grew up in Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, my father was a scientist from Long Island. Uh, my mother was uh, uh, an artist from Kentucky. And we grew up in Lynchburg, Virginia, which is a small, fairly conservative town. Um, I grew up in a very secular household. Um, I didn't read the Bible until I went to college. Um, and then it was in a comparative religions course. So I've always felt like the odd man out. In terms of religion, I've always sort of to paraphrase, you know, the way Kurt Vonnegut, someone asked Kurt Vonnegut late in his life, you know, how he felt about a very close friend of his becoming a Catholic. And so I felt very happy for him because he found something larger than himself to believe in and the community who supported him. And I'm just never going to be that guy. And I'm just, and I feel that's, that's been sort of the story of my life. Growing up in terms of my feelings for homosexuality, it's like I was always taught well, you know, family, we, we know people who are gay, we have family or friends who are gay. But then I also had a very masculine father who was always sort of monitoring me. And, you know, I'm this art, artsy type who likes to sit in the room and write stories and draw pictures. He's <laughs> terrible at sports. And, you know, he, he has his fears. And I had this sort of father who would go out in the driveway and rebuild an engine and he would cut himself and he would cauterize with gasoline. So it's like that kind of where you're always just, you know, really aware of that. So I, I, I you know, coming from that pool of, you know, being in a southern town and not being not quite southern enough and not quite Baptist enough, not quite Baptist at all, and getting beaten up a lot. I always just regarded that homosexuality or being gay as that thing you couldn't afford to be. Um, so that was sort of my starting point. Um, yeah, and all sorts of things that I believe in and think or know about the world have changed since then, but for a whole spectrum of reasons. So. Um, so uh, because we, so there are lots of cool things that I've heard. One is um, that there's a lot of uh, no information around this topic as you're growing up, and sort of where does that leave you um, in a very tentative, sort of confusing space. Um, and then when there is information, there's much more clarity about uh, this is how I'm supposed to be. But it seems I'm impressed by how many people had zero information and just had to like sort of discover like how am I supposed to feel about this. Um, but also experiencing some of what would be even if you were a straight man, um, just going into a field that might be more dominated by gay men. Um, 
So I think that's really interesting. Um, and But I also do uh, love that you have offered yourself up as sort of a... I feel like a sacrifice. <laughs> 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 I preach about it all. <laughs> Did I know? <laughs> so, um, so I want to take you up on that, sure. and, and um, I think I, what I'd like to do is invite people to, to ask your own questions um, of each other. Um, but if I, you know, I would like to use you as a little bit to talk for yourself. So, um, I, you know, I do think we're trying to get at um, the core of where beliefs come from and how people come to this place, and and maybe completely out of love. Um, to a place which is drastically different than other folks that come to their positions also from a place of what they feel is love. So, um, you know, I, I think we should talk about that. I don't, do folks have questions they want to ask of one another? I actually, I, I'd love to start, um, it's not so much a question, but I'm, I, I'm so happy to hear your perspective because it's one, um, it's one that even just, I, I personally um, forget that, exi that exists out there a lot. Because so I mean, so many people that you that you hear talking, um, when they when they speak when they speak about that that are that are that that are against homosexuality when they when they talk about it, um, they talk about it in a fearful way, um, and and they and they talk about it in a hateful way, um, and and the th like and the thing is is I actually I have a number of friends who. Feel exactly the same way that you do. Um, that they were that they were raised or that they were that they're very religious people. They were raised in a household where they were taught that they were taught the word of God and they were taught that the word of God is true, and that's why they feel that you know men and women are supposed to be together. Um, but that you know they have no they have no animosity towards homosexuals. They don't feel that you know they're they're lesser people or anything like that. It's just that you know it's not how God intended. And so that's why they're, you know, I'm able to be friends with them because, you know, they don't have these hateful viewpoints. And, it's, and so I really, like, like I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I wanted to say this because, I, like, I, I love that you're here and I love that, that you have this perspective because, you know, it's, it's so refreshing to, to hear someone who is able to, to be on the other side of the issue and, in a non like hateful and fearful way. Yeah, I'd like to piggyback on that because the uh, one of the things that disturbed me going into the, uh, the political area at campaigns last year for marriage and those kind of things was the kind of the invective and, and uh, nastiness between church folk about this issue. And it's uh, and granted it's a very emotional issue for a lot of church folk and like uh, our Reverend Gains are gains. It's gains. 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 Uh, uh, you know, saying sacrificial lamb kind of in, in jest here. The, uh, in the in the universe of African American Christian folk, you know, I was a heathen also. You know, for for supporting that kind of issue. And but it really disturbed me because if anything church folk are supposed to be in relation with God and in relation with each other. And I uh, want to get to, I, I said, let me give you an example. You know, it's, I guess King said you don't have to, uh, what, you don't have to love me, but you got to let me, give me my civil rights and those kind of things. There's a, we, in, in my church being a little bit pers uh, progressive, uh, the Islamic people in our community had no place to worship. Uh, when they came to me and said, can we worship in your church on Friday, I, I immediately said, yes, of course you can. And uh, the, uh, uh, one of the ladies in my church, the little old lady in my church, when we got together for a community meal, uh, she got to meet the most, the Islamic people, and they brought their, their dishes, and we brought our dishes, and we kind of fellowship. And she whispered to me, she whispered over to me, and she said, Larry? <laughs> said they're really nice people <laughs> but, but too bad they're all going to hell you know and, I, and, I, and, and, and but she, she she wasn't being nasty I mean this woman was 80 90 years old she wasn't being nasty but from her world that's what was happening but she put herself there though, in there to fellowship with them to sit with them to eat with them to have conversations with them and I think that's what we're that's what I want you know uh, out, of, out of this whole uh, movement and discussion about
people in general, you know, we don't have to agree, but we can be decent with each other, you know, and we can love each other and we can embrace each other. And, uh, you know, that's kind of where I'm coming Can I push back a little on the notion that, uh, um, I, I think often in, in these types of discussions, mm -hmm. there, there are these generalizations. Mm -hmm. And I think that's unfair in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even the, the, the notion, church people, yeah. that, that carries, uh, it, it stigmatizes, yeah. um, simply because people might disagree. And it certainly isn't out of hatred. It is out of the, it is out of the observation of what they believe to be true. Mm -hmm. And if it is a right, if people have rights to believe, simply because we believe differently, mm -hmm. does not mean, therefore, that we hate. Mm -hmm. um, nor does it mean, for instance, uh, because we, from a heterosexual perspective, disagree, mm -hmm. uh, does that mean, therefore, I have the right to call you heterophobic? No, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's, the, the point I is, I like that term. Too often, I think we too <laughs> often <laughs> think with uh, broad brushes. And uh, that, too, I feel. Because we really don't want to spend the time to engage people and understand why they think approach life the way they do. I, I think we really need to take the time as we're doing today to uh, be more intentional yeah. about uh, the, these issues rather than just, uh, I guess, getting into our corner and lobbying scud misses. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't, doesn't solve it. But I, I, during the campaign, that's what was happening. That's all I'm saying. During yeah. the campaign. Well, let, let me share this with you. Uh, yeah. I, on both sides. I, well, that's the point. Yeah, I'll that's the I wasn't point. saying it was all one side. I'm sorry. Maybe that's what I should yeah, say. Excuse yeah. me. On both sides. I, I got a, yeah. a, 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 just a, a number of just vile phone calls yeah, so no that, that are just unacceptable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the name of, yeah. of love, uh, or in, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm just telling you, it happens on both sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that I didn't mean that it was only one okay. side. I'm right. sorry. I mean, but yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I think we yeah. need to be careful and not paint with the broad brush and have a more, um, I guess, understanding that some people do disagree. Sure they do. Yeah, uh, sure. From, from you know, more of a, um, from, again, my mind is from a biblical perspective yeah. that doesn't allow me the uh, privilege yeah. to, um, for instance, let me cite your, your illustration, from an Islamic perspective, um, to for me to invite to, to allow an Islamic church or preacher to come in, I essentially am condoning, contrary to what I, I teach. If I allow them to in your space. Oh, abs absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and it, what what it does, it it minimizes the value of the truth that I teach. The same is, is true relative to uh, homosexuality. Um, if, if I'm if I'm going to be true to the Word of God, both to my my training um, as a child, I was taught this is God's Word, and so I embrace it as such. And I uh, it, this was reinforced in school, um, and and so for me to teach it or or to um, to teach it from a more progressive and I'm already worried um, from a progressive perspective. It really denies the validity of what God has said. It minimizes the value of, of what is called, in, in, our, in my circles, mm -hmm. true. If it's true, mm -hmm. it's a truth. It becomes the measure both of, of uh, practice and what we believe. That's, that's how we approach the of God. So we're looking at life through the lens mm -hmm. of scriptural text. Yeah. The only That's thing I would ask, the only approach. thing I'd ask for every game is sure. that from a from a, from a personal standpoint, you mm -hmm. know, all faiths are basically belief systems, and uh, you know, as a belief system, I, I would trust that you would allow that there are other belief systems that people are just as passionate. Oh, about. I don't deny that. That's, that's so obvious. Yeah. That's so obvious. That's, that's. I think that's the only thing we're asking. There are other belief systems that people feel just as passionate about and sure. feel just to be just as true. Sure. But let me, yeah, okay, well let me yeah. speak to that. That that can't there can't all be true. There can only be one truth. <laughs> In terms of absolute I, I, issues. Yeah, yeah. There can only be just one truth. Well let me say this past again. Sure. I really yes. appreciate you being here also. I, thank you. Um, I would be the culprit that 
came up with these images Excellent. from my mind. Excellent. And the one thing that I feel from you mm -hmm. and from your words, mm -hmm. you're not specifically characterized in these particular works okay. as Reverend Larry mm -hmm. had mentioned about doing the political drama, all the hate. I, I don't feel that from you. I don't feel that you taught that. But let me ask you this. Sure. In your church, when it came time to vote mm -hmm. for giving rights or banning rights, mm -hmm. how do you feel the church responsibility is for such an act when we're talking about human society. Mm -hmm. Did I, is that question clear? Mm -hmm. so, the church, uh, believers, um, beyond just the institution, but the believers, the people themselves, um, we, we teach, again, the, the lens with which we look at the world is, is God's word. We, we teach people to embrace that and help them to embrace that. What does this mean in terms of your life and practice, your faith and practice? Um, so in, in terms of making a choice, <clears throat> it wasn't difficult at all. Not hard. There was nothing um, challenging about it. So this is my question. Sure. Is, right so ahead. now, because you may be <laughs> helping me with something. You should definitely help me with something. But I want to be clear on what your answer is. Sure. When you said it was not difficult, mm -hmm. I don't understand that answer. It's not difficult for the people of God to look at an issue and determine from the lens of Scripture what God's will is, how I ought to respond to this. In terms of rights? Rights, you, you name it, yes, correct, correct and what, what, what the idea of rights entail. What does that mean? So, if you elaborate on that. I'd like to, I'd like to suggest, man, I, you know what, I didn't come to preach, but no, 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 <laughs> honestly, preach, but in terms of rights, in terms yeah, of rights. Yeah, um, you know, particularly when, when we're thinking about um, the civil rights, I, I think the, the term has been, and, and I don't want to sound mean here, but I think it's been co-opted. Um, because there absolutely is nothing to compare with what my uh, grandfather and grandmother went through uh, with water hoses from the fire, knocking them down in the street because they sought civil rights. There's nothing to compare with what happened in Alabama with dogs being turned under simply because of the color of their skin. There's nothing to compare when we're talking about homosexuality and African Americans uh, being denied that they were full humans simply because of the color. I just see no comparison at all. So when we're talking about civil rights from our perspective, uh, we, we, we do approach it from what the scripture says, that our rights are true, that men, men, are, men are equal, created equal, all men are created equal. But does that mean, therefore, that in terms of behavior, that we're to equate all behavior that particularly is uh, called immoral behavior in scripture, does that mean therefore that all men have the right to uh, immorally engage in activities that are contrary, that God condemns? That's why I asked that question. Sure. Go ahead, forgive me. That's why I asked that question. That's why I asked that question. Because I heard you say two things just now. Sure. I heard you say all men created it. And then you said, except. You didn't say except, but now I'm paraphrasing. Because I heard except. Sure. Which except immoral men. No, I didn't say that. No, sir. I apologize. And that's what I no. interpreted. No, I said because immoral behavior. Does that mean, the question is, simply because we're created equal, does that therefore also mean that we have the right to behave immorally as a civil right? And I would say to you, from a biblical perspective, absolutely not. Therefore, if I could use, if I could use the, 
if we're talking about immorality, again, from a biblical perspective, God says you shall not lie. I want to create the civil right to lie. See what I'm saying? Now, now I'm just saying from a biblical perspective, it's, an, it's clearly, categorically stated that lying is a sin. It violates the holiness of God. So, therefore, how should I approach lying or any other behavior, human behavior? I think from, again, from my perspective, from a biblical perspective, I, I look at all life through the lens of what God said. So that, and forgive me for running on. No, so no. It, it tends to be a... Uh, yeah, I think people want to hear it. No, I definitely want to so, yeah. um, so, the conversation is making me think that um, there's another question that might be worth exploring um, that's um, not very religious in nature, mm -hmm. but um, just, again, sort of on the personal, the mm -hmm. personal story, which I think helps us connect with what's true for us individually, um, and I think that's an important way to ground this conversation. So um, one of the questions that I have is, how, for you personally, did you discover your, your experience of your gender and your sexuality? How did that occur? That feel like, um, let me try this thing out? Or did that feel like it just always was a certain way? What was, what's your experience of developing a sense of gender and sexuality? Uh, coming from my family, every year on my birthday, my mom just would ask me, um, so we have a tough question for you. Yeah. Are you straight? <laughs> Every year. And I have to be like, you know, really sorry guys, but I think I am. <laughs> and <clears throat> it's, I mean, I can't really, I don't know if I can pinpoint, at least for me, when I felt confident that I was or like sure that I am heterosexual. Um, I felt open to other possibilities and to, um, you know, find like, my, I guess whenever my mom said, uh, you know, I fell in love with your mother as a person, not her gender. Um, and so I feel like as I've gotten older, I've definitely um, considered just like whether who I like to be around and who I just want to spend more time with and then how my feelings evolve from there um, and my attraction because, I mean, I, I, I don't think that I can solely base on attraction because I think that women are absolutely beautiful. Um, but I'm not, I think that just, it's a matter, well for me, it's the growth and the time together with that person that I become more
but but more so than that, I've always been like I was always called a tomboy. I was always all of, when I was from a very young age, my, I was always better friends with boys than I was with girls. Um, and and I was and I like and again from a very young age, I started thinking to myself that gosh, it would be so much easier if I was a boy. Um, and it was it was something that was very very frustrating for me. And um, and not in and and I'm and it, and not in any kind of like there's there's this whole other issue that's completely that's completely separate from homosexuality of, tra of, of, of transgenderism um, and it's not any kind of, like I I love being a girl being a girl is awesome um, and so it's not that I that I'm uncomfortable with my gender it was just that like because of like like you know now in my in my artistic career like I. I'm a welder and, and I'm a woodworker and you know and I so I exist in the, the professional field that I exist in is is, is, a, is, a, is a very male one and so it's always like that's one that has always been a struggle for me um, and so um, and, it, and, and so and again it wasn't until high school that I that I finally understood like oh that's why I find girls attractive it's because of because again, like literally, from what I was saying before, like I didn't, I it, like I literally did not know what being a lesbian was or being gay was, so I never connected those two things. So yeah, so that's what, like, that's my, that's my story. <laughs> Anybody else have? You don't have to have fun about it. So, I was born in the 40s. <laughs> um, the, uh, I grew up in, in the area where I really experienced the Jim Crow. So my father's from Mississippi, mother from Alabama. We migrated north for jobs. Family, I mean, the uh, black folk were migrating north to Detroit, Chicago for jobs, and going back to the uh, homestead visits. And I remember going to the border, with, and, and the Midwest was town called Cairo, Illinois, and my father would teach me, now you cannot behave. You have to look down at the ground. You have to say, yes, sir, and no, sir. And he did the same thing. And I remember his talk about that as I got older. And my father was a very dignified man, and I can't believe he had to put his head down, you know, do the ass up, scratch, scratch thing. But leading to sexuality, uh, I recall growing up, because I was, again, I was, I was always a pretty good athlete. I ended up going to Purdue University, and I played football at Purdue University. And I did get drafted, but I didn't play. Uh, I left and went back and got a master's degree, went into corporate world for the last 30 some years. And um, <clears throat> there was a fellow in the locker room. He was drafted to be the first black quarterback. They thought he was going to be the first. Now, for you young folk, uh, there was an era, there really was an era when the National Football League thought black men couldn't be quarterbacks because they weren't smart enough. <laughs> you probably remember those. So anyway, they drafted the, So he ended up being a defensive back. But the, the thing is, he and I became very close friends. And he was one of the best athletes in the country back in that era. And he ended up getting drafted and uh, playing, actually. We had a drunken uh, night as, as, kid, as college kids do. Party and that kind of thing. He got drunk and uh, he fell into my arms and he confessed to me that he was gay. And we went to sleep together, just sleep. And we woke up the next morning and I said, I can be your friend, but I cannot be your lover. And But I would do you know, whatever I can to be your friend. And uh, from that, we did form a bond. And sadly to say, he ended up committing suicide. But, uh, I, and I don't know if it was because of his struggle, I'm not sure, because, but there was so much homophobia in the locker room. And I know he was struggling, struggling with his life being this great star athlete at a nationally recognized school, playing in a Rose Bowl and all that stuff, and, and then living this secret, secret side of his life. Uh, but that's the only thing I could offer him was to be his friend. Uh, growing up in locker rooms and stuff, you know, you see a lot of naked men from the time you're like, in, back in the old days, uh, because back in those days, 
uh, their, the modesty level was at the all time. I mean, you had to be naked. The coaches made you. You went swimming naked. You did everything naked until you got dressed to go either to the field or home. And the coaches, and this is something that would never be allowed today. It was in the 50s, the coaches actually showered with you, because I was thinking about Sandusky with that mm -hmm. thing there. But they actually showered with you with school approval. So it was but um, not that it was the impropriety, but I'm just saying they allowed it. Mm -hmm. uh, so coming up, I would say to myself that, yeah, I recognize men for their attractiveness. I recognize a man if he was uh, you know, had some special feature about them or what have you that was attractive, hair, eyes, that kind of thing. I had no problem saying that, you know, Joe, got some, Joe has some really beautiful eyes or something like that. But it wasn't sexual. I could be friends with him, but I didn't feel like I had to sleep with him. Uh, and I, I would offer myself to other people like that, and they, sometimes it was accepted, sometimes it wasn't, because sometimes people just wanted physical stuff. But, that's, that's kind of my story. I, I was, I could, I guess I could get it back. I guess it's a question. I was always kind of, I was always attracted to girls. Uh, in Gary, Indiana, at that time, it was probably a, one of the first places that I can remember being where interracial dating and so forth was accepted. The town didn't have a lot of tradition, first of all. It was only a 50 year old, it was only, it was only, uh, discovered and existed because of the steel industry, nothing else. And uh, so it, it, it had a lot of immigrants there, it had a lot of uh, people coming from various places just to find work. Uh, uh, I don't remember all, you know, we dated interracially even in the 50s, in the area, from the 50s into the 60s. Uh, um, <clears throat> when I first heard that question, it was a really easy answer for me. And I would basically related to, because I grew up in the 60s where everybody had a TV, pretty much in the 60s. And one of my first memories as far as gender relationships that I can recall now, thinking backwards, would be from watching a James Bond movie. And I would say that would have been my earliest experience with seeing the relationship between a man and a woman, because I grew up in the same part also. So you think of this guy, he's got these blondes and brunettes, and in an hour's time, it's been like four or five of them. <laughs> and so for me, that became, and then they got this handsome guy, and he's got the cars, and the guns, and so forth. So for me, I identified with that character. That was my first experience for me, as I think backwards. Yeah, because the only time I was around my dad, if my mother wasn't around. I never saw them together, except for when I graduated high school. So, and then as I grew up, I just always found girls cute and attractive. And today, I'm more comfortable with any person of gender. Also recognize a handsome man, but I don't want to touch him. I find them attractive, so let me take that back. I mean physically attractive, because I can see how Two handsome men can be together. I can see that. I can see it. But actually, when they get to doing, <laughs> touching, I'm still, I'm still, you know, away from that part. But I also identify, and this is just me personally, I would, and, and this is another thing I like to say again on record that I believe everyone should have their opinion and feel the way that they do. And my work, is not necessarily condoning anything specific. It's more about rights, the human rights, than it is about sexuality. Uh, but again, I think that everybody should be able to do what they want outside of me because I have to live in my own space. And so the thing that I 
thing that I find interesting is that we all find our truth somewhere, and um, in, 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 in specific is that question of how you find your relationship to your gender identity and your sexuality, it seems like no matter what your social messages are, that may explain your experience of ease or tension with whatever identity, but that an identity is sort of emerges for people out of, you know, out from inside rather than from outside in. And then there's the task of reconciling with, with, with whether that fits with what's outside or not, um, from whatever vantage point you're sort of, you know, whatever vantage point you're in. Um, isn't society, doesn't society have a little, out of culture, I guess. You know, like women could go, I remember even when I was a kid, women could go to a dance and dance with each other, nobody cared. But, you know, boys didn't dance with each other. It wasn't, you know. And, uh, Still like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I, a comfortableness. I'm, gonna, I, I'm sorry, I have to disagree with that a little. Me and, my, me and my best friend went to my junior prom together, and like, this is just my best friend. We've been best friends since we were 10 years old, and like, and we danced together, and that was, and like, and I, and a parent, I found out later that like, people were like, uncomfortable with that. With two women, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. I understand. I think you're, and that maybe, I just, maybe yeah, less, more less, more less more discomfort, more maybe. Women yeah. Yeah. yeah, less discomfort, because you see it more, you see more women dancing together in clubs and stuff like that. They might have went and broke up the men they didn't say that problem. That's right. There's a comfortableness with, with the same sex. I guess getting back to there is a comfortableness and a distance with the same with the same gender people that is taught, I think, and within the family. You know, my father kissed me all the time. And he kissed me on the top of the arm. We just hugged and we would kiss each other on the cheek. So I never had any problem with uh, hugging another man and kissing him on the cheek with him because I was okay, my dad did it to me. But some people I know I've run encountered uh, and become friends with, you know, they have that space, don't get too close, you know. Don't get too, and I'm not, I'm not offended by that, I just think that's just the way they've been taught, you know, individual families. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I think like also part of the, like seeing like two women together versus two men, uh, the men being more comfortable is that in general, men are perceived to be much more sexual in general and women to be like relatively really? not. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, and so then there's like this perception of that it could it's like much more likely to be like a friendship and that the men this one is like automatically more like sexualized. Oh, and yeah, I mean like I think that's like another layer of that's true. misinformation. Because we talk you know, little boys, when you put them in groups, we don't talk when we're young to each other. We play with each other. We wrestle with each other. We do actions with each other. But girls actually communicate and touch and talk to each other and share things that boys just wouldn't even think of saying until we're much older and feel more secure. I think boys in general are insecure just growing up in general. More so than girls. So, um, uh, that's what I'm thinking. If you, if you want to do something else, let me know. But what I'm thinking is that we um, sort of bring it back to this idea of preach, the name of the show, um, and the things that we really believe in, um, and our truths, whether they come from a biblical perspective, or from some inner wisdom, or from some family value, or some, somewhere else. Um, but for us to each think about what is, what would you preach for? Um, and where does that, where does your preaching come from? Um, and I don't know if it's possible to do a, a go around as a way of closing out the circle, but that's kind of how I'm thinking to, to wrap this up, unless somebody else has something else they want to have more conversation about. It. Or what do you preach for? And um, where does your, where does your conviction come from? Uh, I, I just think I've been dying to say it. I don't know if I should. Please. But, but um, when I got when I got married, um, my mother-in-law is a Methodist minister, and so we wanted her to do the service. Um, but I was very adamant that I didn't want her to mention God, and she got a little bit out of shape about that. We had a long conversation about that, <laughs> and ultimately she's like, "Well, then why do you want to get married?" Like, what are you doing? And, and I said, you know, ultimately, this is not, you know, 
from my point of view, this is not a religious ceremony. This is a contract. This is the way my father always talked about it. It's like, and he was very serious about this. It's like, you have entered into this contract with this person that you are exclusively it with them, and you are building a life together, and you're building a family, and that is bond, and that's it. And it's like, and if you at some point have to get out of that contract, the two of you, because you're going to kill each other, you do it. But if you break the contract, you're done. And that's what he told me. It's like, you, if you get married and you mess around, I'm never talking to you again. Mm -hmm. And that's been the way it's been in my family. It's like, it's like, that is like, it's the contract. But it was always a contract. And I have this feeling that whenever we get these conversations about marriage and, and what is true and what is right, I feel like we have this constitution, we have this contract that we've all entered into with one another as citizens. And explicitly within that contract, we're not supposed to make any determinations about one another's relationships, business, personal, whatever, uh, with one another that are based on faith. They are supposed to be purely based on these codified rights that exist as a legal document that we have all entered in together. And the problem I have with marriage is that it's both. It's one of the same. To a lot of people, it is, it is this very sacred right. It's not for me. For me, it is a purely governmental thing, and I could have gotten a dude at the courthouse to do it. But I got my mother-in-law to do it because it was very important. And my mother-in-law spoke at my father's funeral, even though he was an atheist. And they had an understanding by the time they got to know each other. Um, but that's my thing. It's like I feel like I, I have a problem with this conversation, specifically about rights and specifically about marriage, because I feel like we are talking about something that is defined by a legal document that implicitly says that that whereas this tradition has emerged, you know, from this spiritual place and from religious tradition, as I enter into it, as it is legally binding, as it is seen, it is an institution of the state. So I know that's not everybody's perspective, but I know that's not how everybody sees it. That's but. From my standpoint, from a strictly legal standpoint, that's how I see it. And that's why I feel like this whole thing, for me, is a mess. We start talking about what we believe versus what rights people should have. I'm like, well, what you believe is frankly irrelevant. Like, what ultimately, what this contract we've entered into. Because frankly, what, you, what lots and lots of people, many millions more people than I and I believe in are totally different. So we can't use that as a basis for us to determine our life together on this planet. We have to be decent to one another. We have this other set of rules that's outside of that. And that's how I feel about that. And maybe that's entirely too simple. But that's where I come from. So. Like 
his his idea is that marriage should literally have no like like rights attached to it whatsoever in terms of like in terms of like because like right now there are, for instance like there are tax breaks and and like and there's you know like um like there's uh like there's there are, there are hospital visitation rights and you know things like that and and so because there is this issue of you know if, if there is an issue of whether or not um because to him you know like like when like homosexuals should not be together it is it is not it is not morally right it is not you know and and he does not he does not believe in it he does not sanction it but you know but and and to him the government sanctioning it therefore isn't right either but he doesn't think that they're bad he doesn't think that they're like horrible people and he and he therefore doesn't think that they should not have the same rights the same you know civil rights and equal rights as he does and so if that's the case then the marriage shouldn't have these 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 you know governmental these federal rights attached to it one of the reasons back to what i would preach one of the reasons that i did this work it totally goes to your point about the constitution which is why I asked you the question earlier, which I didn't get a chance to elaborate on, was how do you tell your congregation to vote on an issue such as this? And the reason I asked that question gets back to the Constitution and this being America. And I've heard people like Michael Steele say that there's no similarity to the gay rights issue and the African Americans rights, the civil rights. And when you start talking about like hoses and dogs and things like that, that part is correct. There's no doubt about that because society has even moved past even anyone being treated that way in America. But the Constitution and even I've heard many pastors say, to you today, that all men should be created equal. And in America, when we had slaves, that was the Constitution. The Constitution was written, and we had slaves. So all men were created equal, but all men were not. Because although African Americans were considered people, And this is where I get the similarity. It, it's as small as it is, there's no gray area between right and wrong. And there's also no gray area between equality for all people. No matter, because people doesn't have a but. There's not a but or if or unless. It's just all. And it's not great. It doesn't say some people are created equal. Some people should be created equal. 200 years from now, only a certain group of Americans should have the same rights. And that's the only thing that I preach. That everybody should have the same equality. I believe that if you have strong convictions that are in religion, that's perfect for you and everyone else that believes that. Because everyone needs to believe, to believe that in something that's bigger than themselves. But when it comes time to thinking about America and that what the, the struggle that African Americans went through even get an issue of human rights. Because that's really what it's about. It's not just civil rights. It's not about anything smaller than human in America. And if you're American, no one's supposed to have something that someone else doesn't. And as soon as that is recognized, there has to be a change, like with slavery. 
like within the 60s with being able to ride anywhere you want on the bus. Like being able to be in the same barracks as the white guys when you're flying across to Japan dropping bombs. So I'm just preaching that in America, if you're American, it's, everybody should have the same rights. It shouldn't even be a conversation when it comes down to voting or banning something. And that's what this work for me is about. It's about, and it's really about that. It's, it's a line of hypocrisy, and it's unfortunate everyone doesn't see it that way, but it is, because it's not equal. If you're telling someone to go against someone in America, because religion is separate from legal, and that's the point that this works about. It's about the legality of equality. I preach. I'm sorry. I'm done. Somebody else going to talk? I don't want to. Yeah, I, I guess I preach in uh, love and being in relationship with God and being in relationship with each other. Um, if I get into my belief system and my truth, being greater than someone else's truth, I think we get into this biblical karate that leads us down the path to uh, nowhere, if you will. But my, my, my position is that we invite the church into our marriages if we choose to. Because there are a lot of people that go to the courthouse just like you do and never go to church a day in their lives. If I choose to invite the church into my marriage, then I will abide by all the church's rules and regulations according to that marriage. If I choose not to, the church has no business involved in my marriage. The, uh, we go to the church or we invite the church into our marriages, but it's odd that we go to the courthouse to dissolve it. Uh, the, uh, I, 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 I would, uh, if I were, what would I say, if I were king of the world or whatever, I would have my church set up. Somebody comes ask me if they want to get married, and I'd say, go see the county licensing authority first. Okay? Deal with him or her. Then come back to me and invite me into your marriage. And tell me why you want me invited into your marriage and what purpose do you want me to uh, have by inviting me into your marriage. And that's where the line should draw. If, if not, it's none of my business. We are closing. Let me thank you again yeah. for inviting. I really appreciate this. And it has been unique, and I've uh, enjoyed everything I've heard, the perspectives. And very interesting. Helps me again to, to I guess, affirm journeys. We're all on a journey. That I, I, I know. But in terms of preaching, I preach what is true. That's what I preach. That's what God called it. Um, if I could draw from a, a biblical story, I've heard of Pilate, correct? Pilate? Pilate? Yeah. Pontius Pontius. Pontius. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and you've heard of Jesus. Jesus stood in front of Pontius Pilate, condemned for doing Preaching. Imagine that. <laughs> Preaching a gospel of, of love that basically said he came as a human sacrifice because God loves us. Christ came to die. He came to die as a human sacrifice for our sin. Basically, he stood in, in front of Pilate, Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate asked him, are you a king? One of the statements that Jesus made, he said, I came here to bear witness to the truth. That's what he said, he came to the world to bear witness to what is true. Basically declaring that there is such a thing as absolute moral truth. He 
He was it. In fact, he said to Pilate, I came to bear witness of what is true. Pilate said to Jesus, looking at Jesus, and I believe, according to the scripture, that Jesus is the embodiment, the physical manifestation of the eternal God, the creator. Pilate looked into the eyes of Jesus and asked Jesus, after Jesus said, I came to bear witness of the truth, Pilate said, what is true? Got up and walked away. He wasn't really interested in what was true. He merely wanted to be sarcastic about what Jesus was preaching. I want to say to you that that, for the most part, is the basis for which I am passionate about. And you probably have picked up on that passion. <laughs> I could talk for hours and hours about this very thing. I love it. It is who I am. And I am stimulated by this conversation because, again, God has a lot to say about it. Mm -hmm. And I am a proponent of what I believe is, is true. So I want to preach that, and I thank you again for the opportunity to share it, share the truth relative to sexuality. God created male and female. That's, that's what the Bible says. And he created it for a reason. In fact, one of the reasons that uh, the male and female distinctions, and, and it's interesting. I mean, it's also interesting. If you look at it from the Hebrew perspective, the actual word for male is the word sephah. And it means to point. The actual uh, word for female is the Hebrew word nekeva. It means to be pierced. If you take that which points and that which is being pierced, what God saw in terms of sexuality for the male and female was the actual act of intercourse between the male and the female. So in God's perspective, true sexuality is indeed a male and a female. Um, so we, from a biblical perspective, um, even though we're accused again of being, I guess, uh, bigoted, <laughs> uh, small mind, just just a number of pejoratives are, are, are launched our way, and, and fine. If that's what it means, then fine. But I, I take that. But nevertheless, um, I really appreciate this opportunity to share with you. And I don't know that you've ever heard things. Like that's not what we needed. Not needed. So I I feel like I've been instrumental in a way, um, and I, I again I'm, I'm really appreciative of your time and, and your ears. God bless you all. I, I just want to say that there are many, many seminaries in the United States teaching uh, very uh, thoughtful, interpretive classes on scripture, and all of them do not agree on the same interpretation of those symbols. Yeah, I would wonder, <coughs> in being Jewish, just in terms of e, uh, male, man being ish, one ish, ish right. any isha. isha. Exactly. So I'm wondering, is it maybe grammatically, is it the feminine? Are you pointing to Nikeva? I think it's correct. A, is, is that's the, the feminine. Grammatically, that's, that's right. the feminine. So exactly. you're pointing to the grammatical, not the correct. man and woman, the words man and woman, but in terms no, of grammatical, male, female, male, female and grammatic, correct. grammatical term. Okay. Male, zakah, female, Nikeva. Because ish comes from fire and isha. Exactly. Uh, exactly. There's only one thing I still haven't been not clear on. I apologize. <laughs> I'm still sorry, but not sorry, curious about the voting aspect. Okay. That's what I haven't been, I wanted to hear you say, what do you think about the voting aspect? Because you're saying religious, I understand and I respect your religious views, mm -hmm. because you're a minister, you're a pastor of God. Mm -hmm. So that's expected mm -hmm. that you would feel that way. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to going into vote, mm -hmm. do you separate? No, we, we can't dichotomize. That's not no, we don't do that. What is true is true. Um, it, it's, it's so, true. do you think that it, that would it be? Do you think that? So, you feel it's best to vote against the rights than to not vote at all. It's best to vote by way of what God has said. Be consistent with what God. I, I, in fact, I've never told our congregation what how to vote. I don't. I don't. What I do is is preach. <laughs> Preach truth, and what it does, it governs, how people, it governs how people think. If they see life 
from God's perspective, hmm, that's what I need to do. That's how I need to vote. That's, that's why I think it's far more, uh, there, there's more of a comprehensive approach to the preaching of truth and where I don't have to itemize every, every little awesome. issue. Uh, just preach truth. And Jesus said, you will know the truth. Is that your truth? So um, I also want to thank everybody. Um, the, preach, the, the truth that I would preach is listening, um, and I think we did a good job of listening to each other. Um, so thanks, and thanks for asking me to hold the space as moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you for that, but you know you didn't share your truth. Yeah, I wondered if I should. Deliberate? Well, I realized that I couldn't share my own end. 